A welcome to MOOC NPTEL course on bioengineering an interface with biology and medicine. Uh, last week we started discussing about why biology is so important for engineering discipline. Uh, I try to give you various uh, is examples in which way uh, we can see that you know the bioengineering has started making a huge impact in, in many applications. Then we kind of uh, talked about basics especially the life properties, the cell, different cell organelles and their function. I also tried to provide you uh, a clinician's perspective by interaction with Dr. Ali Esgar Moyadi uh, to give that you know in which way clinicians are also looking at various engineering solutions, the technological solutions for various medical problems. So, this week we are going to talk mainly about uh, the DNA and DNA tools and how biotechnology has started making impact by knowing the, the DNA technologies. So, we are going to talk about uh, you know the various technologies involved in doing the molecular biology research, especially polymerase chain reaction, different gene cloning processes, those things we are going to cover in this week. But I thought it will be important uh, before we start going into detail of those technologies to first introduce you again with the nucleic acids and central dogma. So, that is the theme for today's lecture. Although I uh, realize that you know you might have already studied this uh, in your earlier courses in, in other classes, but just kind of refreshing you about some of the concepts for the nucleic acids, gene and operon. And then I will talk to you about central dogma and in which way it is important in the omics era. And then these concepts how we can uh, you know try to utilize these understanding then in the next uh, uh, next set of lectures in this whole week is going to utilize the DNA technologies and going to illustrate you in which way we can do research in these areas. So, let us first start with the uh, basic concepts of nucleic acid uh, which are the basic components of DNA. So, uh, the main function of the nucleic acid is to uh, store and transmit the entire genetic information. And there are you know, two uh, specific classes uh, of sugars uh, based on which the entire uh, classification happens for nucleic acid which is DNA or RNA right deoxyribonucleic acid DNA and ribonucleic acid or RNA. So, the major constituents of uh, the chromosomes which are located in the nucleus of a cell is the DNA which constitutes the genetic material. Whereas, the ribonucleic acid or RNA is the functional molecule or the working copy of DNA which then participate in the process of protein synthesis. So, uh, from DNA to RNA the process of transcription happens and then from RNA to protein process of translation happens. Let, let me now show you again and, and more so refresh you about uh, the DNA structure and the components the nut bolts involved in making DNA structure. So, for example, there are four bases the monomers which constitutes DNA and uh, these are the structure shown on the screen which is cytosine, thymine, adenine and guanine ATGC. Now, uh, cytosine and thymine these are six membered ring uh, with two nitrogen uh, which is the having the pyrimidine ring structure or the uh, adenine and guanine they share the structure with the purine ring and which is pyrimidine plus addition of an imidazole ring. Now, uracil is, uh, uh, is unique because that is uh, you know uh, found in replacing thymine in, in case of RNA. So, uh, you can look at the structure of uracil here. Now, let us talk about briefly the sugars. There are two uh, sugars involved one is a, a ribose sugar and another is a deoxyribose sugar. Both of them have the pentose sugar uh, backbone and now on the uh, uh, second carbon you can see there is a hydroxyl OH group there in the ribose sugar whereas in the deoxyribose it is hydrogen. So, that is the difference between the ribose and deoxyribose. And then third important component is a phosphate uh, uh, chain which is uh, joined with the on the you know uh, C 5 carbon with the hydroxyl of the sugar whether in case of ribose or deoxyribose. And then because of this phosphate group these nucleotides they are negatively charged and that property is heavily used in the DNA electrophoresis. So, now let us kind of again uh, look into these uh, individual components. We talked about the bases, we talked about the uh, sugar and we talked about the phosphate right. These three components together uh, form the nucleic acids and uh, let us look at some terminology for example, nucleoside when you are combining a base and the sugar form that together gives rise to nucleoside. 
or when we add uh, a base sugar and phosphate chain that is nucleotide. And then when you are uh, combining many nucleotides which are actually joined with the uh, phosphodiester bonds that is known as nucleic acids. So, a nucleotide is a subunit of nucleic acid which consists of the nitrogen containing bases which is having the 5 carbon sugar and the phosphate group. So, again the structure is shown you here which is for a nucleotide. So, now in this way now you can uh, easily uh, decode the entire uh, DNA structure uh, which is very you know, straightforward now we have good understanding that you know in which way nitrogenous bases this the sugar phosphate backbone is constituting the DNA structure. But of course, it was not known earlier and the scientist uh, Watson and Crick uh, they get the credit for deducing the structure of the DNA and their you know how these are the two strands are arranged in a helical form how this is intertwined uh, and the sugar phosphate backbone lies on the outside whereas, the bases are inside. And then uh, the uh, base pairs are specifically uh, forming the bonds which is hydrogen bonds uh, between A and T and G and C bases right. So, uh, there was always that you know uh, a quest to elucidate uh, the structure of DNA and many scientists you know started working in that area and, and try to uh, find out in which way uh, the DNA structure is, is made. So, uh, uh, the Linus Pauling he made a hypothesis that there are three chains which are twisted around each other and they form you know some sort of rope like strands and that could be you know how the DNA structure is made. So, then Wilkinson and Franklin these scientists they provided X-ray crystallography data and then they found that you know nucleotides are 3.4 angstrom apart in the chain and the structure uh, repeats are found at the 34 angstrom interval. So, there that gave much more clarity for the uh, you know the structure of DNA and then a scientist Chargaff he provided the, the some basic rule that you know the uh, A uh, uh, components are going to be equal to the T components of so percentage of A equals to percentage of T and percentage of G equals to percentage of C base pairs. So, this summarizes the kind of you know what we have discussed uh, the structure of DNA in which way adenine and thymine uh, they form the two hydrogen bonds and guanine cytosine they form uh, three hydrogen bonds and the structure of uh, DNA decoded by uh, scientists Watson and Crick for which they were awarded Nobel Prize in 1962. Now, then you know how DNA makes its multiple copies. So, the DNA duplication or replication of DNA that is uh, another interesting concept. Uh, so, the DNA double helix is actually uh, you know it starts unwinding at the replication fork. So, now two single strands are produced from this double helix uh, DNA which serves as templates for polymerization of free nucleotides. Now, DNA polymerase uh, it starts polymerizing these nucleotides by addition of some new nucleotides to the 3 prime end of the DNA chain and now from the same DNA uh, now the two copies of DNA is made and as you can see that you know from the template uh, S strand now we have new uh, strand being synthesized and now we got two uh, DNA molecules uh, as a process of replication. So, there are different theories which are involved in the DNA replication. I will talk to you about you know uh, the DNA replication and some of the classical experiments done in some other context later on. But just for the timing I thought to uh, you know uh, just give you the feel of that you know how DNA copies are being made and uh, why it is so important for us to understand DNA structure. Because you know the uh, DNA is so much fundamental to our life to our hereditary information that you know how DNA structure is, is, is found uh, and how you know uh, it is compatible with all you know any possible sequence of bases that is very important I think for us to appreciate and, and understand that the sequences of bases uh, along any DNA strand they act as a very efficient uh, means to store the genetic information. So, knowing the DNA structure becomes very crucial and this DNA sequence actually ultimately uh, determines the sequence of the uh, uh, you know, ribonucleic acid and eventually the proteins are formed from that. So, these sequences of bases along with one strand they are you know completely determines the sequence of uh, other strand and then they are going to dictate the RNA formation and the protein formation. So, after you know uh, reviewing some basic concepts of DNA and its DNA structure let us now uh, uh, think about a question about what is a gene right. Uh, the concept of gene has actually evolved uh, through the history of genetics uh, starting from you know the scientists like Mendel 
who was thinking about you know these are some hereditary factors uh, which are uh, he did not know about gene that these informations are passing from one to next generation probably there are some factors which are involved which are having these information stored and then Morgan kind of provided some further experimental evidences that you know these uh, uh, hereditary units uh, are actually located on the chromosome. So, many scientists have contributed in the journey and now finally, we know that you know what we consider as gene is actually a discrete unit of inheritance or you can also define that it is a region of a specific nucleotide sequences in a chromosome or you can say it is a DNA sequence that codes for a specific polypeptide chain. So, uh, if you just want to uh, you know get a broad overview of gene, uh, I think we can summarize it is the region of DNA that can be expressed to produce a final functional product. Uh, it can be a polypeptide or it can be an RNA molecule. So, this is how you can think about you know gene uh, one of the uh, discrete unit of inheritance which is uh, providing this kind of functional information. Now, organization of a typical eukaryotic gene is you know uh, is really complex and having uh, you know many processes which are involving to uh, to shuffle from the DNA to make the RNA, but kind of this site uh, try to illustrate you uh, that we have you know various exon regions and we have various introns. Now, in the uh, in the process of alternative splicing in which way now these uh, introns are removed and the coded form the exons are coming together to give rise to the functional RNA molecule. So, there are multiple control elements which are actually associated with the eukaryotic genes and these are the segments of non-coding DNA uh, which help to regulate the transcription by binding to the certain proteins. The concept of lac operon becomes uh, uh, very uh, crucial. Uh, it, in this model you can see that uh, you know in the uh, if you have allolactose which is an isomer of lactose sugar that uh, you know derepresses the operon by inactivating the repressure. And in this manner, uh, this enzymes for the lactose could be utilized uh, and then it can be further induced. So, I am going to show you this in one of the animation and to explain you in much more detail. In prokaryotes, transcription by RNA polymerase can take place with the help of an activator protein. However, in the presence of a repressor molecule, the binding site for RNA polymerase is inaccessible due to which transcription does not occur. In the ground state, the repressor does not remain bound because of which the gene is turned on. The lac operon consists of a group of genes that are responsible for transport and metabolism of lactose sugar in certain bacteria like E. coli. This operon is under negative regulation by the lac I repressor protein. In absence of the inducer, the tetrameric repressor binds to the operator region, thereby preventing transcription by RNA polymerase. In presence of the inducer, the inducer binds to the repressor protein, which then prevents it from binding to the operator and therefore allows gene expression. An inducible system is off in its crown state and must be turned on by an effector molecule, which is known as the inducer. In positive regulation mechanism, however, the inducer binds to the inactive activator to produce the active activator molecule, which in turn facilitates binding of RNA polymerase to the promoter to turn on expression. In the negative regulation mechanism, the inducer binds to repressor and prevents it from binding to the operator region. This allows RNA polymerase to proceed with transcription by binding to the promoter. The ground state in case of repressible system is on. 
it has to be turned off by an effector molecule which is known as a co-repressor. In positive regulation, the co-repressor binds to the activator molecule and prevents its binding to the promoter region, thereby turning off gene expression. In case of negative regulation mechanism, the co-repressor binds to the inactive repressor molecule and activates it, thereby preventing gene expression. The lac operon consists of a group of genes that are responsible for transport and metabolism of lactose sugar in certain bacteria like E. coli. This operon is under negative regulation by the lac I repressor protein. In absence of the inducer, the tetrameric repressor binds to the operator region thereby preventing transcription by RNA polymerase. In presence of the inducer, the inducer binds to the repressor protein, which then prevents it from binding to the operator and therefore allows gene expression. Lac operon also undergoes positive regulation by means of the cyclic AMP cap system. Glucose is a preferred energy source for bacteria and if both glucose and lactose are present, beta-galactosidase enzyme which metabolizes lactose is not synthesized. High glucose levels prevent synthesis of cyclic AMP which is essential for binding to the catabolite activator protein. This protein facilitates transcription of the lac operon. When glucose levels are low, cyclic AMP is produced, which binds to the scap, which in turn binds to a distal part of the promoter region and facilitates transcription. Uh, but this kind of you know slide illustrates you the uh, broad model of lac operon and in which way it regulates the synthesis of inducible enzymes. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, you know thinking about uh, from the cell uh, where we can find the DNA, right? So let's say human body is made of uh, billions and trillions of cells we have discussed in the last class as well, and then each of those cell is having these uh, you know uh, the nucleus which contains these genetic material. Now each cell contains two copies of uh, these chromosomes and now these chromosomes if you expand further you can see the long DNA molecules uh, even the genes and the functional region of DNA we can, we can see over there and then uh, now you can see the tiny picture of you know how uh, these DNA molecules you know uh, if you think about the cells each cell having the nucleus having the chromosomes having the, uh, the, the gene and their uh, the DNA part. So this is you know a really tiny uh, bit of the uh, a molecule present in the cell, but that is so crucial which dictates all the hereditary information. And it is you know kind of packaging in the cell becomes very crucial as well. And uh, again to refresh you from the previous uh, 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 lectures in the cell context, if you think you know how uh, the nucleic acid contents are so tightly packed inside the nucleus uh, in a small area uh, with you know very uh, uh, intricate you know binding with histone proteins. So these histone proteins and these DNA molecules they form these nucleosomes and these nucleosomes together uh, are packed to form the chromatins. So this is how uh, you know uh, these particular packaging happens inside the nucleus. And, and let's thinking about eukaryotic genomes how they are organized into the chromosomes. I think you know the knowing about the histone proteins uh, becomes very crucial. So these histone proteins as I mentioned H2A, H2B, H3 and H4 they are positively charged proteins which could interact with the DNA molecule which is negatively charged and that actually helps to compact the DNA and these nucleosomes could be seen like the beads on a string. So this is how you can, uh, you can think about from DNA to chromosomes. Uh, a chromosome consists of a DNA molecule which is packed together with the proteins and now uh, these chromosomes could be seen which 
uh, are having these you know bead kind of structures right all right so human uh, having 23 pair of chromosomes 22 autosomes plus one pair of sex chromosomes x or y chromosomes and a process known as karyotyping uh, where you want to look at the pattern of each of the chromosomes tells us about the uh, you know is the pattern of these chromosomes are normal or is there any abnormality can be seen and for many disorders like especially uh, you know chromosomal aberrations can be found uh, and that actually helps us to to deduce if there is some sort of syndrome is present like down syndrome uh, or some sort of you know the issues with any other chromosomes abnormalities are there and even for such determination people look at the x and y chromosomes and their patterns so this image just shows you know the color painting of these various chromosomes but ideally it, it shows us the organization for uh, the whole genome all right so uh, there have been many discoveries which have contributed immensely to the uh, field of uh, you know uh, overall uh, dna related uh, discoveries which have contributed entirely from genetics to genomics uh, uh, areas i'm going to show you a couple of milestones uh, discoveries although you know we are going to talk in much more detail about you know many of these fundamentals and their applications in subsequent lectures but just to kind of you know uh, refresh you and and bring you to the scale uh, starting from gregor mandel the father of genetics 1822 to 1884 lot of elegant experiments being done on the pea plant which gives us the uh, the basic idea for you know the uh, how uh, uh, various laws of heredity are governed and then with the ideas for discrete factors which mendel mentioned the genes uh, are actually going to transmit characteristics from one generation to the other generation over the period then we had you know the discoveries by uh, watson and crick uh, which illustri illustrated the structure of dna and uh, but you know the initial uh, part from 1865 from mendel uh, is you know gets credit uh, and mendel uh, is known as the father of genetics for his uh, contribution then as you go on the time scale uh, sturvent uh, he made the first uh, linear map of the genes in 1913 uh, and then came the watson and crick contribution for double helical structure of dna in 1953 uh, then scientists to nirenberg khurana and holly they first time uh, mentioned the genetic code uh, in 1966 scientists cohen and boyer they developed recombinant dna technology in 1972 and then uh, sanger uh, maxson and gilbert they developed dna sequencing methods in 1977 in 1983 the first human disease uh, gene was mapped with the dna markers especially in the disease of huntington disease was shown and uh, you know one of the milestone technologies polymerase chain reaction was invented in 1985 and then human genome organization uh, started you know uh, an ambitious project of knowing about all the human genes in 1988 uh, and then while those things were happening we started knowing more about uh, the cell about cloning about you know development process and reprogramming and that eventually culminated into the cloning of an animal dolly by ion wilbet in 1997 and uh, that is another you know one of the scientific fiction and and kind of story in which uh, one could produce a cell or organism with the same nuclear genome as another cell or organism and dr ian wilmot of rosen institute uh, they cloned this uh, sheep dolly uh, which was a major accomplishment that time then human genome sequence uh, projects were getting completed in the uh, years 2001 2003 uh, and then first draft of the human genome map was presented in in cover page of nature and science uh and and you know those projects actually help us to to really try to get a bigger picture of what is happening inside uh you know the in entire human genome what are all genes present there and uh you know it was first most ambitious project to really understand uh you know beyond moving on to the single gene and looking at you know just the characteristics governed from each gene that what is happening in the entire genome and all the gene how they are governing the function so that kind of you know was a as a big accomplishment Uh, not only to understand the gene but also in the scientific community in which way we are able to now uh, work you know for uh, understanding the all the molecules of life for example omics molecules so this brings to the the second part which is uh, thinking about central dogma so now we have studied about dna which is the genetic blueprint and just you know imagine that in a cell now you want to uh, to first of all you want to uh, know that you know where the the dna is and that dna is going to make the molecular photocopy which is rna and that is you know like the functional molecule has to be initiated and from those rna molecule the proteins has to be made now so now just use the same analogy for let's say making a building 
So, let us say you know we are in Mumbai in Powai area in IIT Bombay and we want to make a building a, a campus here. So, from the map now you know that you know where is the DNA the genetic blueprint and in that area then some contractors will come and then they will try to uh, you know make a map that where the building has to be made. And then the proteins uh, or the building material will come which is going to be like you know the mortars and bricks which is going to create that building which is you know like the engines of biology. So, this is something you know which uh, uh, helps you to uh, provide a good analogy in which way DNA to RNA to proteins everything is crucial, but in which way the proteins are much more you know uh, uh, direct information they are providing much more functional molecules while the genetic blueprint comes from the DNA. Now, let us you know kind of briefly refresh the classes of RNAs, we have uh, the messenger RNAs, we have transfer RNAs and ribosomal RNAs. Uh, messenger RNAs they provide a template for protein synthesis for or the transition process to happen, but they are very less abundant only you know 5 percent population is there for the mRNA. Where the transfer RNAs they are the carriers of amino acids uh, and activated form to ribosomes. Then the ribosomal RNAs they are the major component of ribosomes, they provide catalytic and structural roles and they are actually the most abundant among the RNA population. So, RNAs they are involved in the protein synthesis process, again this is you know uh, an interesting but the, the complex uh, subject which uh, needs much more you know full lecture. Uh, but just to brief you, uh, the mRNA provides the long sequence of nucleotides which serves as a template for the protein synthesis to happen. Now, the tRNAs they are involved in the protein synthesis, but that binds an amino acid at one end and the base pairs with an mRNA codon on the other hand and then that serves as an adapter that translates mRNA code into a sequence of amino acids. Then rRNA it forms the central components of ribosomes, it also plays catalytic and structural roles in the protein synthesis process. So, transcription and translation again you know there is uh, a lot of fundamentals involved in understanding these processes. This slide just kind of gives you illustration that in which way from DNA the RNAs are being formed in the process of transcription and then from there in which way various amino acids are formed and the translation process happens uh, to generate the proteins. So, this is you know uh, we will talk as we go along, but uh, I just want to convey you that you know there is orderly and unidirectional flow of information happens in the cell. Uh, as a part of central dogma and that actually that information is in the base sequence of the DNA which flows from DNA to RNA to the protein uh, and this is what we say the central dogma which involves two important steps of transcription and translation and uh, of course, you know you are also aware that there could be reverse transcription as well, but the information could also flow from RNA to DNA and uh, that is also you know very crucial for many biological phenomena to happen. Uh, an important thing you know why from the same gene we still see different type of RNA forms and multiple protein forms you know becomes very crucial to understand and that is actually being dictated by two important phenomenon one is alternative splicing. So, in alternative splicing that is the process in which the exons or the coding sequence of pre mRNA they are produced by the transcription of a gene and then they are combined in different ways during RNA splicing. So, what happens then the resulting mature mRNA it gives rise to different protein products as a part of translation and then they are the isoforms of one another. So, now you had a single gene, but actually that can give rise to multiple uh, you know uh, RNA forms and different protein products. So, as you can see in the picture from the uh, one of the pre mRNA we have uh, mature mRNA A and mature mRNA B they are being formed and they give rise to the red color protein protein A or the green color protein protein B. Then after the proteins are being synthesized then further modification may happen at the protein level and that is known as the post translational modifications. So, many proteins undergo post translation modification at some of their amino acid residues and some you know uh, molecules could be added for example, sugar moieties as a part of glycosylation or phosphate uh, moieties as a part of the phosphorylation or it can be hydroxylation, methylation, alkylation, acet acetylation uh, and many kind of modifications may happen uh, which makes the protein very different functionally. And that is where you know studying the RNA molecules or studying protein molecules provide much more functional information because many of these modifications are actually quite relevant thinking about the actual physiological questions. right? So, uh, this information what I just conveyed you uh, looking at a central dogma all the genes then the transcripts and the proteins. Uh, now, scientists are trying to study in much more totality. 
For example, can we study all the genes of a given organism, of a given system? Uh, let us say for human we have no idea for the entire genome and that we say the human genome project or human genome sequences are available now. And similarly, do we have idea for the entire human transcriptome or human uh, proteome and that can help us to really understand the system much better as compared to thinking about just one or two protein at a time. So, then the omics understanding that so the, this whole field is known as omics field which aims to look at all the molecules present you know in a given system. And then this information could be very valuable and useful for the patient's treatment and patient therapy. Think about the personalized medicine, which is an area upcoming right now, where intention is to look at these biomolecules, uh, you know, from a given individual and use that entire information for their treatment. So, whether you think about, you know, having the diagnostic test or think about, you know, the integrating these personalized uh, interventions or optimizing them over the period for the treatment modalities all of them requires good understanding of you know, these basic biomolecules and if possible the technology to understand them at the omics level. So, in summary today we just talked about the basics of uh, nucleic acid especially the DNA and RNA. Uh, we also try to cover uh, briefly about histones and in which way DNA are being packed. Uh, then I try to convey you the that in which way central dogma uh, flows the information from DNA to RNA in the process of transcription and then protein in the form of translation. And then in which way the new emerging field of omics technology is able to uh, you know is actually aiming to understand the complex signaling pathways which could be involved in the biological system and that may lead us to do better cure at the personalized medicine level. So, uh, these are all some of the basics fundamental of course, you know to uh, know more in detail uh, you have to uh, either take some more advanced classes or you have to uh, you know take more specialized biological classes, but uh, our intention was to give you some overview to refresh you about these biomolecules. And now we are set to talk to you about various advances which are happening in the DNA tools and biotechnology area and that will be the main focus for the next of the uh, lectures for this week. Thank you very much. Thank you.